Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the FANAC Fan History Zoom session. Today, our topic is the evolution of art and artists. We are very fortunate to have with us Grant Canfield, Tim Kirk, Dan Steffen, and Jim Schul, uh, who I hope will take himself off of mute. I'm going to start out by asking <laughs> everybody to uh, please introduce yourselves and tell us how you got into fandom in the first place. So, Grant, why don't you begin? Uh, okay. Uh, well, how I got into fandom. I'm Grant Canfield. Uh, I was guess I was best known as a fan artist in the 1970s. Uh, and uh, actually, my first uh, published piece of fan material, of fan art, was uh, Anillo for uh, Dick Geis's uh, Science Fiction Review. And uh, the way I got into fandom was first I was uh, reading the Marie Wolf uh, uh, fanzine column in Imagination uh, way back in William Hamling's Imagination. Uh, and then uh, when I was in college in 1969, I made a, 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 a vacation trip out to Los Angeles and went to Collector's Bookstore and uh, found an issue of Science Fiction Review. And uh, and uh, that was the next year I got out of college and uh, I started sending material off. And one of the first people I sent material to uh, was uh, Dick Geis for, for SFR. And uh, from the pages of his uh, zine, I uh, hooked up with other fan ads, uh, one of them being Dan Steffen. And uh, uh, the rest, as they say, is history. That's how I got into it. Dan, why don't you go next? All right. Well, um, I, I've discovered fandom by discovering uh, prozines in my local drugstore. I have always went to look at comic books, and I uh, no new comics had come in one day, so I got distracted by the gaudy covers, and I started reading uh, uh, the digest in about the mid-60s. And uh, there was a column in If, Worlds of If, by uh, Lynn Carter, of all people, where he would write about fandom, write about conventions and such things. And that's where I first heard about the whole idea of fanzine publishing and, and the like. Although I had seen stuff published by comic fans in the 60s, you know, Batmania and uh, <laughs> the, the like. Uh, uh, and I always loved the idea of publishing one's own magazine, whatever it might be. And um, so I started sending way for fanzines. Uh, first fanzine I ever got was an issue of uh, Yandro, that uh, unkillable yellow thing. <laughs> it was always on either tan or goldenrod paper. And then I started seeing all of the other artists that were being printed there. And I got totally hooked. And if you don't mind, if I may have another second here, I made a, a list because um, one of the things that attracted me to fandom, both as a fan and as an artist, was when I discovered fanzines. It was a time when the, um, the hippie movement and the counterculture was starting to discover fandom as well. And there was a huge influx of talented writers and artists like Grant and Jim and Tim. But before I ever got published at, uh, in 1971, this was some of the people who were in the fanzines I was getting and were uh, exciting me. Ray Nelson, P. Joe Trimble, George Metzger, Steve Stiles, Bill Rotzler, George Barr, Tim, Grant, Jay Kinney, Vaughn Bodie, Arthur Thompson, known as Adam, Richard Bergeron, Jack Gaughan, a, a very successful pro, was right in there having fun with us. Richard Flinchbow, Robert E. Gilbert, Mike Gilbert, Connie Faddis, Alicia Austin, Doug Lovenstein, Tom Foster, Ken Fletcher, Stephen Fabian, Ross Chamberlain, Joe Staten, Alexis Gilliland, Jim McLeod, and lots of others. And these are the people that I was, I saw and I said, I want to be part of this party. I want to try and live up to the 
what these people are doing. And that's how I got into it. 70s were an amazing time for fan art. Oh, it was incredible. Yeah. Mostly thanks to Mr. Kirk. <laughs> really? You should go next. <laughs> okay, Tim. Uh, my name is Tim Kirk. Uh, I got into to fan art probably mostly through Lord of the Rings fandom. Uh, I read the Lord of the Rings in 11th grade in high school. Somebody, I don't know who, told me that there were... I think the Tolkien Society or something like that were, were publishing these mimeographed fanzines. So I found out how to contact them and I started sending artwork to them and later to the Mythopoic Society and Mythlore. And from there I got into conventions and B. Joe Trimble's art shows and uh, it just kind of snowballed. But and, and as uh, Dan said, the, the array of talent in those days was phenomenal, just phenomenal. And uh, I take my hat off to all of them. So. Absolutely. They made a big difference in the way fanzines looked in the late 60s and 70s, as opposed to how they looked in the early 60s and the 50s, when oh. printing was more primitive. And as soon as uh, good reproduction in the form of uh, electro stencils and and such. Yeah, offset printing. Offset printing. People just came out of the woodwork. Because let's I get to that in a minute if we can. Yeah, Jim, can... why don't you um, introduce, tell us how you got it and get started? All right, you uh, your connection is a little garbled, but I think you just pointed to me. Yes, please. So, so um, maybe I betray my age because I'm not really sure exactly how I got into fandom. But I think it went something like this. Um, you know that there were the Digest science fiction uh, magazines that would be sold at the newsstand, and I'd go down to Hollywood to World Book of News. And there were the classic, the classy uh, magazines like Analog. And then there are the second tier down. But the neat thing about the second tier down Digest is they seem to be a little looser, goosey, as far as... Um, in the letter section and in the editor's comments, and they would point in those digests to, oh, by the way, there are these fanzines or there are these clubs or these organizations. And just simply thinking, wow, there's somebody else who likes science fiction besides myself. I started reaching out. And, you know, again, I, just like Tim said, you know, he mentioned B. Joe Trimble, and I should mention John Trimble as well, because, you know, you can't have B. Joe without John. Um, but I ended up, you know, making the rounds and going down to their home there in downtown L.A., which, you know, to a city kid out in the suburbs of Los Angeles, that was exotic mm -hmm. to go all the way downtown. I mean, it was I think it was two buses and a long walk up the hill to their to their home. But I met people like Tim and George Barr and others who because basically, you know, John and B. Joe's home was kind of a I don't know, it's it's kind of club central or art central. Because there was just not, you know, people to meet. There was artwork to see. And this was a time, uh, as we've already said, of great experimentation, a lot of great artists. But also it was kind of low risk. Because remember, you know, we've already talked about, you know, if you're publishing a ditto zine or a mimeo zine, you're only publishing at best a few hundred copies. So it was a very kind of closed environment. But because it was a small environment, it enabled me to take risks because i could do something for free of course because it's a fan thing you do it for free uh and people would comment on what i did and frankly no one had ever commented on what i did in my entire life other than my mother who said whatever you did show you know that's that's fine it's lovely uh, but you know to actually get real criticism you know from people like george and tim and alicia and John and Bijo, you know, that was incredibly invaluable. Now, Bill Rotz are not so much because Bill just kind of looked at me, grumped and, you know, moved on. Uh, but it enabled me not just to draw, but to draw and fail. Because, again, it was a low risk environment. Absolutely. So I could do something and go, oh, crap, that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, you know, would draw and, and ditto. I did in Hecto. And I would not recommend it because it takes a week to get the ink off your hands. Um, plus, it doesn't smell good. 
Uh, Ditto was a close second, but, you know, it was like 100 copies. And basically, uh, it was just a great time because it was a time of experimentation. And eventually it led me to Losfus. And I'm I'm sure we're going to be talking about the L.A. Science Fiction and Fantasy Society during this show. Well, you've mentioned, um, several of you have mentioned um, B. Joe and John. When Actually, when we did an interview with them, we didn't actually talk all that much about art. We talked about everything else that they were involved in. So um, it's good for you um, that you are mentioning this. It gives us uh, 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 some additional um, insight into their effect in the field. But one of the things... um, I have noticed that in many of the artists I've talked to in fandom really got um, hooked on all of this by way of comics. Did any of you guys, um, were you involved in in comics fandom or uh, trying to illustrate comics type material? I, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Some, go ahead, man. I was just going to say, as I mentioned earlier, some comics fanzines made it into my uh, my uh, existence, and uh, I was very intrigued by them. And I actually published one of my own in 1966, Didoed, as Jim referred to it. Uh, I wouldn't show it to a living soul. In fact, the last person I showed it to was Robert Lickman, and he's no longer among us. So, <laughs> but um, uh, I, I need to say one other thing. Yes, B. Joe was very important, B. Joe and John and the art shows. But part of, we were talking before what got us into fandom. Part of it was discovering it and sticking one's toe in the water to try and see if I could play that game. And having a couple of people, I think Linda Bushiger was the first person to accept a piece of my art, though not the first to publish it. And um, uh, once a couple of pieces got published, the most miraculous thing happened was people started writing to me and asking me to provide them with drawings. This is so outside the realm of, of anything I was used to. And uh, I was just gobsmacked by it. And then when I started going to conventions with more regularity, uh, the uh, uh, invitation to the, to B. Joe's art show and just the warmth in which the community enveloped me and other artists like Grant and Jay and so many of us. It was like to be so welcomed and to be offered a chance to be seen as a, a peer was absurd because I was just a dumb 16, 17 year old kid who uh, had no idea that any of this could happen. And it, I, frankly, it changed my life and my approach to art. Grant, you were going to say something? Uh, I was going to say that uh, regarding comics, I was never into comics fandom, uh, but I'd have to say that comics played a huge part in me becoming a cartoonist. Uh, I mean, I was reading comics uh, from a very early age. Uh, My grandfather had a a drugstore, and uh, he'd save uh, all the comics for us, and uh, it was the funny animal comics that uh, that I particularly liked. Uh, uh, the Disney, the Walter Lance, uh, Pogo, uh, uh, Warner Brothers, uh, all of those comics. And the way I first started learning to draw, I am self-taught as an artist, is uh, I would trace the comic covers of uh, those funny animal comics until uh, then I started uh, drawing my own little comic characters and stuff. And uh, my parents and grandparents were incredibly supportive of all this. And, and uh, uh, I just kept that up. Uh, all, well, the rest of my life uh, in high school, I was the cartoonist for the school paper and for the school yearbook in college. I was the cartoonist for the school paper. Uh, but I was also mostly interested in science fiction so when I got out of college and moved to California, uh, married the former uh, Catherine Jackson and moved to California, uh, I got into the uh, the science fiction fandom. Uh, 
but never into comics fandom, oddly enough. Hmm. Uh, I'll just say two words. Carl Barks. Oh, yeah. of course. The Grand Master of all of us. I wouldn't be here. My great uncle and aunt gave me a subscription to Walt Disney's Comics and Stories when I was about five, and it came in the mail every month for 10 mm -hmm. years. So I had, no, got, I had no choice but be influenced by him. I've still got boxes full of uh, uh, WDCNS. <laughs> and yeah. Scrooge, uh, Uncle Scrooge. Yeah. I still and have Uncle Scrooge, Scrooge, of course. Yeah, I would, I would add, I would add to the Holy Trinity, the uh, Carl Barks, Walt Kelly, and Hergé, who did Tintin. Oh, for uh -huh. sure. I mean, for all sure. of those, all of those three really had a deep impact on me because they showed me how. To, well, you know, there was a reality to each of those three. I mean, when you drew, when they drew something, and I read it. I mean, it was, you know, there was research behind what Carl, you know, drew. I mean, he oh. did research, and you know, even though it was a funny animal comic not to be taken seriously he did take it seriously uh the same and again the same with Hergé and the same with Walt Kelly there was uh Absolutely. really a lot of research and they it taught me by example and and that's one of the things I will say about that era and again going back to John and Bijo's house is a lot of what I learned was by example of you guys I would look at what you three were doing and I'd go "Ooh, I could do that or sometimes it was like I didn't know you could do that and so I would do something, they would go out and in lieu of, you know, of course, there, no one fanzine was paying money. But to me, the payment was, well, it was respect and it was also criticism. And so when people responded and going, oh, we like that, do more of this, less of that, uh, that was an education for me. And it, it really did um, teach me. And some of the things that, I mean, I learned were pretty prosaic. I mean, there was... Um, uh, a warehouse downtown LA that sold paper uh, for, you know, for publication of fanzines. I think it was like two bucks for a half a ream, 250 sheets. And some of the paper was pretty crummy, but you could get some really good paper there for maybe $3. And uh, I think it was a combination of linen and, and wood pulp and the linen made sure that it was almost archival quality, which I started to draw on. And I wouldn't have learned that except, again, through contact, uh, and which proves that fanzines weren't just, you know, a, a place to express artwork, but it was also a fan community that happened in real time. And mm -hmm. that, that again, is irreplaceable. Tim, were any of the comics um, influencing you? Well, I, I share... Uh, my my colleagues' early experience. I I got a subscription to Uncle Scrooge and to Comics and Stories by Carl Barks in the early 1950s. So I was six seven years old, and those comic books, his ability to tell stories with pictures, made me want to do the same thing. Uh, and as as someone said, his not only his attention to research, I mean, he used National Geographic so that the Taj Mahal looked like the Taj Mahal when he drew up things like that, the southwestern desert of the United States. But he was funny. He was, and none of the other duck artists, I thought, were nearly as humorous or, any, or the funny animal uh, artists in general, except maybe Walt Kelly, were just, were just made, they made me laugh and they still made me laugh. And so that that kind of inspired me to want to be funny and tell stories. You know, I, I, I found that Carl. I'm sorry, uh, but I, I found that Carl Box was always well. He could be childlike, but he was never childish. Even though the well Disney put. comics, Disney comics and stories were a publication for children, I never felt that Carl Barks talked down to me. At the at the time, we didn't even know who was Carl Barks. We just thought of him as the good artist. Mm -hmm. uh, that there was uh, uh, all these other uh, Disney artists, uh, and the stories they told weren't as funny. Uh, the art wasn't as uh, as crisp and and interesting. Uh, but uh, Carl Barks, every time you could tell a Carl Barks story as soon as you opened it, uh, just by the way the ducks were drawn. And the way he laid the pages out, you could tell he had been right. a story guy at the studio because there were storyboards, basically. 
Oh, there, there, were, there were later Disney artists that came along, like uh, uh, Dan Rosa and and, uh, and uh, mm -hmm. Gips. What was, what was Gips' first name? Dan. Dan uh, Gips. Yeah, Dan. but also uh, William Van Horn, who I think oh, is and William one Van of Horn, the best. Another very good one. Yeah, they came along later, but uh, when we were coming into it, it was Carl Barks far and away, and then and for me also Walt Kelly. At the time, I didn't realize that Walt Kelly was was such an adult uh, uh, entertainer, if you will. Uh, Pogo was uh, was so sophisticated. And it was always above my head. It was above my head, too, but I love the art. Mm -hmm. Yes. It was, it was just fantastic art. That's what I aspired to. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I, I, was, I, I aspired to that, but, but when I got into fandom, uh, the ones that uh, I thought that were uh, most influential to me were Tim, Alicia Austin, George Barr, Steve Fabian, and Rotzler. Mm -hmm. Those For were sure. those were the big names and and uh, the ones that I aspired to. Uh, uh, I found myself. <laughs> uh, sorry, Tim. I found myself uh, ripping you off uh, <laughs> frequently. <laughs> it's not rip. It's research. That's it. That was it's it. Not stealing. Yeah. No, it's homage, homage. homage. Of course, I was a couple of years behind you, Grant. So therefore, yeah. I agree with the list you gave. But you're on that list for me. I mean, you have always been one of the people that I have tried to draw up to and my art because Thank there you. are certain people I've always admired, like yourself and like Tim and like Jay Kinney, and I could name others. But yeah. they're like an audience that I always have tried to draw up to bring myself up to the level of what I perceived you all to be. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so, so say some more about your early fanish experiences and what kept, what kept you coming back? Is it all about sending off your art and getting responses to it or is there more to it? I started well, going to the part of it. Yeah. When, when, I got into, uh, when I uh, uh, got out to California after college, and I started sending art off to uh, people like Geis, uh, Al Snyder of Crossroads, and uh, a little bit later, Dan. I sent a lot of stuff to Dan uh, and uh, uh, Hank Luttrell. That was another one of my favorites. Uh, his uh, his fanzine, Starling, uh, I just thought had a lot of character. And uh, it, it, it also, it wasn't just focused on um, science fiction. It was kind of... Uh, several different uh, venues of uh, popular culture. I, I Because I started publishing fanzines, uh, it all became part of the process, drawing, learning to write, learning to publish. That kind of pushed me along more than just being a fan artist, though that's basically how I identify. I've published uh, gen zines over the years, and then there, but there's been always been a decade between <laughs> one, one title and the next. And, uh, but I've never stopped drawing, uh, uh, by and large until now my elderly years when I don't do it as much. Well, well but, Dan, you once took, uh, 20 years to publish some drawings that I gave you. Uh, well, that's Remember true. I'm a hoarder. <laughs> I'm a hoarder. Please, uh, uh, Tim, we haven't heard enough from you. Uh, you uh, you were so inspirational to to all of us. I'm sure to the three of us and to many others. And and the way you carried that along into a professional career, in which the quality of your work was always uh, so outstanding. Uh, what what was the transition like for you? Were you surprised that? Uh, I mean, I know you you did your um, your Tolkien paintings for for your degree and and all of that kind of stuff. But were you expecting just to slide into being an illustrator? That was always my plan. Once, really, since the 1950s, uh, that's what I wanted to do. I stayed very focused. I knew I wouldn't be a professional basketball player mm. uh, or an auto mechanic or, or or an accountant. But I I had. I had this deep desire to tell stories and by getting published in fanzines and later going to conventions, I think my first big convention was Baycon in what, 1960 something? 68, I think. Yeah. But Westercon's before that. 
And to be able to socialize like that with, with a lot of other people that thought the way I did, and Lospis certainly too, um, that made a big difference to me because I saw that there was a community here uh, that I could speak to and then they could speak to me. And so that one thing kind of led to another. And I got my master's degree with, with Lord of the Rings uh, project. Uh, I got a job right out of college, out of my master's degree at Hallmark Cards in Kansas City. So I left Southern California and I went back there for five years and to another greeting card company for briefly in Colorado. And then I, in 1980, I started uh, with Walt Disney Imagineering. Uh, and a lot of this was based on work that I had done previously. My portfolio was really that kind of stuff. Uh, including fan art. And maybe Jim, you had the same experience uh, to get to get hired. Uh, but but they saw a storytelling ability, they saw humor. And fandom really gave me that opportunity and gave me that start. Well, since you opened the door, let me step through it, Tim. Yeah, actually, I blame you because you are the reason i ended up at wdi because i recall one day you called me or contacted me or sent a smoke signal and you invited me and i think we went to marie calendar over in burbank and you made the connection and by opening up and saying well you know there's an opportunity for me to go to wdi now as a disney fan i collected fun maps and i knew about carl box and i knew about the people who worked there but here was an opportunity to actually go and work for the company but again not really knowing that much about it so i ended up again through connection through tim kirk uh ended up making a uh, uh interview with mike morris who was then working there and he was like the gatekeeper but before him actually was peggy ferris uh and so she um uh, you know welcomed me to wdi's lobby at 1401 flower street and then conducted me back to the office of Mike Morris, who then conducted me over to the trailer, which was the studio tour trailer where Tim, you had your office. And I think you were working on the mural for the uh, Brown Derby restaurant with all the caricatures of all of the movie stars and celebrities. The one, unfortunately, you know, was not installed to my knowledge. It must be in a vault somewhere, a much lesser more inferior version took that space not with the characters not nearly as delightful or masterful as what tim drew but uh i continued after waving to tim walking down the hallway where i met uh richard vaughn who uh is of course since retired as most of us are now uh and he reviewed my portfolio and then introduced me to bob weiss who again introduced reviewed my portfolio thanking me for my time I left and I thought well that was a pleasant afternoon and I went back to my day job uh which was in animation I was doing storyboards uh for a lot of very forgettable television programs that were on the air at that time um but anyway I did get a call back and ended up working at WDI for nearly like 32 years and a few days short of 33 wow. so I I blame I blame Tim Kirk for this, or or I thank Tim Kirk. <laughs> I remember it was a meat pie there at Marie Calendar, as I recall. <laughs> you have a good memory. Yeah, well, you know, I I don't excel a lot of things, but I do excel with it as far as meat pies. <laughs> I was uh, stuck in upstate New York for a long time, where there wasn't much of anything, but uh, and eventually I went to school at Syracuse University which is a good school. Uh, but my problem was that I, I grew up in, in the same city and nobody should go to college where they grew up. <laughs> but anyways, uh, I was fortunate enough to um, hook up with Vaughn Bodie, who also lived in Syracuse. Mm -hmm. And this was in the period when he was just uh, giving up his work with fandom and was becoming more and more professional and his cavalier strips were starting to appear in sunpot in in galaxy and and mm -hmm. all of that sort of stuff and i kind of became uh his his fanboy for sure and he had a huge influence on me 
artistically and showed me this the possibilities because he, his imagination was so enormous uh, that uh, it showed me that uh, you could go deep into your imagination and produce things of value and worth. Um, sometime after that, I, um, I moved to uh, Northern Virginia where I became uh, under the influence of the evil Ted White. <laughs> who uh, who has been one of my mentors for uh, most of the rest of my life. Uh, he brought me into Amazing and Fantastic as a very bad illustrator. He uh, took, uh, When he became the editor uh, at Heavy Metal, he uh, helped me get a job in the art department there and where I learned so much about production and stuff like that, and which led me into my own career in uh, uh, publication design and uh, uh, magazine design and a little bit of illustration and such here and there, and as well as whatever I could get, <laughs> because there was no Walt Disney, sadly, <laughs> in the part of the country I lived in. But uh, I, I don't think I would have made the progress without the kind of serious reinforcement and criticism that I got from Ted and other people that were in that fan community that I'm sure is a lot like what you guys got at Last Fest. I think it's interesting that uh, that all three of you guys uh, wound up having careers in art. Uh, I didn't. Uh, uh, I basically I uh, I was a magazine cartoonist through the seventies, but that was kind of just a sideline. But uh, but my career was in architecture, which was very hmm. satisfying. Uh, but it it wasn't it wasn't cartooning. It wasn't illustration. Yes, but I bet you illust all of your experiences as a cartoonist also fed your architectural uh, vocabulary. It did indeed, Dan. That's uh, that's true. So, um, in the talk uh, go ahead, go ahead, Edie. Oh, Somebody right. talk. <laughs> Somebody up there. The um, in the early sixties. Um, there were a lot of artists, uh, a lot of fan artists doing a variety of things, but there seemed to be um, four biggies, uh, or maybe the mid-60s, uh, in an awful lot of fanzines. Tim was one of them, George Barr, Alicia Austin, and slightly later than them, uh, an older guy, Steve Fabian. Mm -hmm. And um, they seemed to be doing in incredible amounts of work. Um, of course, I enjoyed it because there was lots of artists out there doing things. And um, the other three of you came in a little bit after that. Um, did any of those artists, we've already mentioned Tim, but um, can mention him again, uh, uh, influence you? Were they uh, important in the way the art was going in the 60s? Hmm. I wasn't in the fans of fandom in the sixties. I didn't come in until the seventies. And I think Dan was the same. Yes. Uh, yes. Well, were there I, any I can't artists? Speak to the 60s. Yeah, okay. Were there any artists that uh, major artists that were uh, that you would say were influence you and you besides some of the ones you've mentioned or maybe particular ones uh, Dan mentioned a long litany and it was um, a, a great thing for me to actually listen because I was remembering some artists that I had actually forgotten. Well, John well, Barry just mentioned that Alicia uh, probably didn't come into uh, fan art or fanzine art until the seventies also. Uh, but, uh, mm -hmm. but there were professional artists uh, in the sixties when I was uh, um, dosing on the, uh, science fiction digest that uh, there were big influences like Ed Emshwiller and Kelly Frias. Right. Uh, those were, those were like gods to me. Jack Gowan was another one. I I was at the same time that I was getting involved in uh, fandom and doing fan art was the early years of underground comics. And oh, yeah. there were artists in the underground that had a tr profound influence on me. Mm -hmm. uh, like Crumb and uh, of course I mentioned Bodhi 
and, and other people. But later on, as I have gone on over the years, there have been, I, I, at one point I, in my fan career, if I can call it that, I was greatly influenced by Richard Bergeron, who was, of course, a professional New York ad director, ad agency art director. And he had tremendous skills and, and, and talent. And if you ever are lucky enough to just look at a run of Warhoon with the it covers on each issue, like almost uh, Picasso-esque, if you will, um, I realized that you didn't one that we didn't have to stick to the the fan art um, box. You could step a little outside of it. There was a guy in the um, late '60s and early '70s named Richard Flinchbaugh, who I'm very enthusiastic about, mm. though he's almost completely forgotten now. And he was an artist that had a style that would you I would. Looking at it now, we would say is reminiscent of Ralph Steadman. But I have since done a little research, and he predated Steadman, at least in mm. my awareness in, in America. Mm. And um, it was going back and looking at it historically, he came and popped up for about five years and did work unlike anybody else, and then went away. And um, that's one of the sad things about fan art but one of the good things too is his people come through and drop a load and uh, then go away and at least we we uh, can appreciate the, the load very elegant oh. <laughs> you know I, I would also add um, a shout out to the to the editors and producers and publishers of the fanzines because you know we four created content but you had people like Bill Spicer who went out and published the content and edited the content. And I remember um, one of the editors writing to me that, uh, well, I wrote them a letter because of course we're talking about a time when you actually had to write something and put a stamp on the envelope to mail it to someone and then wait for a reply. Maybe you got or did not, but I compliment the fact that all of their pages were justified, meaning, you know, the left mm -hmm. and the right side were in alignment. And I got this long production letter back saying, this is the way you do that. You have to type everything twice. And the first time you have to type it and then put spaces in and count every single line to find out, you know, how many blanks you need to put in to have your pages justified. Now, my reaction to that is I would never do that. That's crazy. But to that person whose name, unfortunately, escapes my memory right now, that was important to them. And so, you know, people who are producing these fanzines and literally they were producing something that had a print run of maybe a few hundred, if that, uh, they were taking an extraordinary amount of care and time to produce everything they did. And, you know, we've talked about some of the names here already, but, you know, those are the people who intrigued me and attracted me. And so you know, I would do or seek to do work for those individuals as I knew I'd get the best response to my work from their publications and they would use my work, which is of course always a good thing. Let and then I, one name, uh, Bill Bowers. Bowers. That's the man whose name I forgot. Yeah. Bill Bowers. My, yeah, he would sit there and just be, do beautifully done fanzines. Number one, you know, the typical fanzines, you know, whatever, eight and a half by 11. And then one issue he turned it on its side and stapled. And I thought, this man has a lot of free time on his hands. You know? <laughs> but he's enjoying it, and, and people enjoy it. And what's interesting is, again, because it's Mimeo, and because I typically don't throw things away, uh, since the last two years, I've been going through my fanzine collection and just finding some wonderful old gems. Of, you know, And it's amazing that they hold up and they didn't fade. Even the, the ditto... Contrary to popular belief, it doesn't fade as much as people assess that it does. It, it bleeds, does hold in so. there. <laughs> it bleeds it, it, through it, the page. <laughs> it, it does. It does. But they've been in boxes away from the sunlight. So maybe that's why. Well, we'll Dill Powers, good Bill name. Well. Go Grant. Uh, Twiltone sure got brittle, though. Oh, Over yeah. There. Yeah. What was that one paper that it had um, a lot of pulp in it and it was in color. It was different colored paper that you could buy, and some of them would be a ream. Well, and like fiber tone. And, that was uh, the one. Fiber tone. tone. Yeah, true. Yeah, that was the cheap, cheap paper, but it did look nice. Yeah, sure. At the time, yeah. 
Except you get some, I'd get a fanzine, someone would have twill tone paper and it might have a purple tint and then they'd change the ink color that they were printing on so it'd be blue on purple and then it'd be, it was a good idea at the time, but it didn't Well, like I said, so well. the, the counterculture was coming into fandom, so. <laughs> That's true. That's true. But there was, there, there was an intersection when you talk about the counterculture, you know, between comics and science fiction because people tended to bleed their interests over each other. And I think that was really invaluable because like Tim said at the top of the show, you know, talking a little bit about the myth of peak society. I, I read CS Lewis's work. I never to this day got through all of the Lord of the Rings because it's just too much work. And I, I did see the film. So I guess that counts, but uh, you know, again, they were an offset. Uh, they published an offset. They had the myth of peak society magazines, and they'd print an offset. And so, you know, I'd go to their meetings, we talk, and they, again, they did Lewis. So I was on board for that. And it gave me an opportunity to express, you know, my interest and sharpen my drawing skills. So and sometimes people like, people like Tom Remy, too, who published Trumpet. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Basically, as a professional magazine. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, and, and who published Al Gold? Andy, oh, Andy Porter. Andy Porter, yeah. right? I yeah, remember. Andy. I remember when I discovered Trumpet uh, was during the period when uh, George Barr was doing uh, the comic strip that he did in there, based on oh, somebody's novel. I don't remember the name of it now, but it was just exquisite work. And I was thinking to myself, I can be part of this community. That was that's what encouraged me, along with everything else, mm -hmm. was just the quality of what, what some people were out there doing for free. Uh, is, I was you know, impressed by that. I don't know if yeah. you guys are uh, uh, following the chat, uh, but John D. Barry just said that the, that was the broken sword. That's mm -hmm. it. Was the that's uh, it the series all done in ballpoint pen? Yeah, oh, ballpoint, that's extraordinary. Yeah. An amazing them. technique. Wow. Yeah, I I, I met uh, Tom Remy when he was living in Dallas. He was working. I think he'd bought a barn or rented a barn and. It looked like a typical Texas bar near Dallas where my relatives live. So I obviously that's the reason I was there. But I called Tom and he said, yeah, come on over. And he was living in a barn. So he said his directions were go down the dirt road, first barn on the left. And, uh, you know, it was a barn from the exterior and the inside looked like, I don't know, it was architecturally exquisite. Uh, but he was publishing trumpet back then and then he went on to publish nickelodeon i believe that's right another magazine and oh and then he did uh i think he was a chair or a publications uh person in charge for the world con in st louis i want to no, say not st louis uh, kansas um, city kansas yeah. city well it's it's misery you know Midwest. i'm a california kid you know it's uh but yeah he he did that again i remember george doing one of the uh, covers and you and you know tim you and george didn't you do a cover for that it was we, a joint effort we, yes for, for the program book it, it was a program or one of the you know magazines up to the program book yeah it was something like that yeah we did uh, full color yeah yeah and they could start doing that and that that was another big boon when fan editors had the money to do things like that mm-hmm yeah. So yeah, we, earlier, I'm sorry, go ahead. Tim. No, we're talking about that, but also I would add to it electro stencils. You know, the invention of electro stencil changed everything that you could just turn in the artwork and, and it would end up printed exactly the way you weren't wanted. It wasn't somebody tracing your artwork. And, you know, I, I know that some of Tim's work, I remember looking at it and grants occasionally it would be traced through by someone who didn't have an electro stencil onto a mimeo stencil and the the idea was there but the you know the line quality was not and i'll i'll leave it at that i agree i hated the when my artwork was traced on the stencil instead of electro stencil well that's one of the things that i can thank ted white for is he he gave me the the skills of of uh, hand stenciling uh um and he was great at it and uh, he had all, all the equipment I needed and and I was determined to be able to do something of quality 
on this primitive system uh, because I was inspired by some of the people who had gone, uh, who had done it back in the uh, old days. You know, I mean, Arthur Thompson and uh, Ray Nelson produced just tremendous amounts of cartoons back in the 50s and early 60s that were mostly uh, hand stenciled, but they still, the personality came through and the humor came through. And um, we lo lost Ray just recently. Uh, and um, I, I think of them uh, along with Rotzler as being kind of the triumvirate of what became fan art for Grant and my generation, you know, I mean, they showed the kind of fun that could be had, they and lots of others, but they really stood out. And uh, it, it was inviting to try and, again, live up to their quality. Well, I'd also add to that is the, um, the ditto stencil templates. They were shading plates and you could buy those and, you know, the you learn skill sets that you never would have learned otherwise. At least I did. And part of it is I started thinking, you know, having to work within the limitations of the media. So I would write up an editor saying, okay, are you, is it a ditto magazine or is it, you know, a Mimeo? And I would, I would learn to adjust my art to the limitations of what their publishing methodology was. And, and then that was a life lesson that carried over for everything I've done and maybe even still do. Although today I'm working now in digital. Not, not primitive old electro stencil or art, but I do remember rapidographs. I mean, oh, you know, oh yeah. I mean, I you know, rapidograph was like a rock moonshot. However, at the same time, the downside of a rapidograph would it would always clog. So this, you know, it's motion. It, becomes yeah, part of your life. <laughs> yeah, it would like it's, end up with this this an automatic reaction. But uh, you know, you'd have to get the ball and you know, go inside and get the little nib and buy the nibs and, you know, go and then start trading, seek, uh, doing trade secrets. Because again, Tim was down Long Beach, but I was here in the San Fernando Valley and I'd go to Carter Saxons over, I think on, well, I remember where they are. They're North Hollywood-ish. And, you know, basically, again, trade secrets where we would swap back and forth with our artists, artists about, okay, I've got a clogged nib. What do you do? And, you know, trying to trade old nibs or there's one nib which had kind of a, I don't know, a metal arc around it to hold the little metal thing with the long piston thing. And that was replaced by plastic, which I guess was an advance, but it was not as good because you couldn't see the little metal thing and clean it out appropriately. I, I, I tell my son these times and he looks at me like, ah, and, and dinosaurs rode, roamed the earth back then, dad. I've had many conversations with John D. Barry about the um, 70s and 80s in uh, production, uh, um, publication production, and John still teaches classes. And uh, sometimes he'll take uh, um, strips of type or um, a, a, a block of wax that used to go in waxers because everything had to be mm -hmm. waxed. And and he tells me that the, the, his students did. They're mystified. What the hell are you doing with a giant block of wax? <laughs> mm -hmm. What do you do? You mean you have to paste these down? <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I, skills I, you 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 acquire them, but they don't always stay useful. What is Letraset? Do they make Letraset anymore? Oh, I don't think so. Letraset? I don't think so. I don't think they even make Zipatone anymore. <laughs> Oh, Zipatone. You, yeah, that I miss Zipatone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Zipatone. I, I was teaching, I taught a class at Cal Arts about two years ago, a little short uh, workshop over four weeks. And I just to see their reaction, I brought in uh, a set of a little box of Zipatone and stencils and rollers and a waxer to see what the reaction of the students was. And beyond, you know, basically, I emptied the box and showed them and said, I, you know, points to the person who can tell me what to do with any of this stuff. And to a person, they had no earthly idea. And although they, the wax are kind of intrigued them because it, it had a little, that little, I don't know, bathtub that you put your wax in and a wire and a plug in. So 
you know, they, I got a lot of strange answers about what that might be. Lots of metal to burn yourself with. Oh yeah. Yeah. And well, I was, yeah, I don't think Tim was ever around to hear me shout or scream uh, in WDI, but you know, I was known there as the world's worst, uh, well, person who would be in charge of handling glues or chemicals of any sort, because whether it was a waxer, I would glue my fingers together. When I was in the model shop at WDI, we had two part cement and I would glue my fingers together. Uh, basically, I was I was a danger or a threat to myself whenever I was working on anything that had chemicals associated with it. So maybe maybe I should be working in digital. It's much safer. I only use digital for cleaning up. Mm -hmm. I'm still a pen on the paper and, you know, lots and lots of sketches and type of type of artist. But I, it's very, very useful for cleaning up. And I like to move lettering around. It, it saves me from uh, things looking out of, uh, <laughs> out of out of alignment and such. Uh, um, but uh, it's great for cleaning up and and the like. But um, and I enjoy have, being able to uh, do half tones. Mm -hmm. But um, I still, you know, basically, if you were to come into my studio now, it just piles of um, paper and pens. And uh, I don't, I I would feel uncomfortable. I think at this stage, trying to learn to do it uh, in, in the computer. That's just my wait weakness. Till goes down. Hey, Mayor. Just wait till there are sunspots and the power grid vanishes. That's right. No, my skill set at mimeoing will become uh, uh, extant again. <laughs> I was always proud that I could work with tools that I got at a gas station. <laughs> <laughs> so felt tips are, are okay. The yeah. what? What tools yeah. were those at the gas station? Oh, uh, magic markers. Oh, <laughs> felt tips, flare pins, pen yeah. tips. Yeah, cheap to. I'm going to step away. Yeah, I uh, uh, because again of my influence from Bodhi, his work was all flare pens and <laughs> magic markers, yeah. and he did a, astonishing stuff with it. Yeah. Uh, I I have learned a lot from him about how to do it. And um, he was uh, a an experimenter who who would who try everything until he found the right thing that he liked. Mm -hmm. And um, even down to the kind of paper that he drew on, he found a a Strathmore that had a lot of I guess a lot of rag in it, so that when he colored his artwork with the magic markers, it would pick up a slight pattern of marbling in the paper that just uh, it, it it was. Unique. Uh, if you get a chance to ever see any of his originals, or it's it's amazing. Then when you realize they're done with magic markers. When I was doing magazine cartooning in the seventies, and I'd occasionally sell a color cartoon, those were all done with magic markers as well. It was uh, uh, I never I never learned how to do how to paint, or to uh, uh, do watercolor or any other kind of coloring medium other than really magic marker. I, I when I do color now it's paint or or watercolor because those magic markers all dried up a long time ago. <laughs> well, not only that, the uh, the drawings that you did with magic marker over the years they tend to fade. Mm. Do well, it's an imperfect thing. Yeah, you draw for reproduction, and then uh, you know, yeah. and then you hope for the best. I mean, I have you can't see it maybe. Probably not from here, but right over my shoulder, all the way at the other side of the room, is a uh, a Hannes Bach painting, my my pride and joy, and uh, um, it, it was it, it he did it for himself because of the period in which he did it. He didn't really have a lot of markets and stuff like that. So, but it's arch it's archaic the way he worked now, and I I appreciate archaic things and archaic uh, means of achieving them. I, I have a question for Tim. Uh, do you know how uh, George Barr did his color? I mean, I know he did a lot of his his uh, line work and shading with uh, ballpoint, but how, how what, what did he use for color? I have a couple of originals and, and it, I think it was mostly watercolor. Yeah. Uh, it might've been tempera, but, but uh, 
basically watercolor and line. And he was just a master of that. Oh, he was, was he was self-taught, wasn't he? As far as I know, yeah. 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 Well, that's what happens sometimes when you're self-taught. You found your you find a medium that nobody else has bothered to take seriously, like ballpoint pens. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh let me get back on a, a different tangent. Um Dan and Jim, I'm not sure if either of the other you also um did your own fanzines. Yes. You edited fanzines. Um how did that work into your um activities and the style of things that you were looking at when you were trying to also take somebody else's material and put it together, whether it was art or um uh, text? Uh, Jim, uh, could you go first, maybe, on this one? Yeah, let's see. I would say I'd consider myself a very failed fanzine publisher. You know, partly it's it's something where I thought, well, they're doing it. How hard can this be? And I quickly found that it it was a lot harder than I thought. However, having said that, actually, I, I, one thing I did do is I did a lot of uh, amateur press association fanzines, mostly uh, for ka cap alpha which was the comic appa mm -hmm. and uh mr kirk did a cover for me that i sent to uh you uh let's see i sent it to you ed just before we started this conversation but it was a wonderful cover of that tim did for esoteric which is a comic alpha which that tim uh did a long riff of the fact that even though my name is only five letters that people consistent to this day garble it and turn it into word salad. So Tim being Tim grabbed hold of that notion and, and, you know, had a, a little caption about, I know, I know that I have a fanzine about from this guy somewhere. What's his name? Shell shale, uh, cull skull, which is a, a always popular iteration of my name. But um, to that end, uh, I did a fanzine for Kappa Alpha for probably 15 years. And uh, KA was, I think, limited to about 50 people, 50 members. And fortunately, I kept copies of at least one copy of every one of my runs, which I put into a, a binder that put into a box, which is downstairs in one of our closets. And it's interesting for me to look back and torture my son because I'll you know, read to him little observations I made about that time. But, um, you know, and like most things, I, at that point when I was doing that, the focus was more of a, I want to call it more of a lifestyle fanzine, uh, even though it was for KA, all about comics. I found myself talking more about what I was doing in my life, uh, what I was doing in, the, in this environment of Southern California I live in, more cultural observations, um, you know, for example, doing a five page dissertation about waiting all night to get the first iPhone because, you know, I had to be, you know, first in line. And, you know, I was there with a good friend, Dave Durham, and we camped out overnight and we were 11th and 12th in line. So we didn't get in the door immediately, but we came in, you know, in the next wave. So that's, that's basically what I did. And eventually I just kind of ran out of things to say, uh, and that I closed the chapter in that book. So I didn't do a lot of quote unquote professional fanzines. I did a lot of KA. Okay. Dan? That kind of, oh. that kind of leads to a personal zine, sort of. There was a, a bunch of those done too. I remember well, when you I, did a, a real good one, Grant, yourself. Waste, waste paper, paper, 10 issues. Uh, and the, uh, the inspiration for that was when I came to uh, San Francisco. In 1971, uh, a tall, long-haired, genial fan named John D. Berry uh, came to visit, and he introduced me to uh, Calvin Dimon, and they started publishing uh, a great little uh, fanzine, a weekly fanzine called Hot Shit, and uh, and I got immediately involved with that, and uh, it was one of the most fun experiences of uh, my fanish life. And as a result of that, uh, uh, I kind of found myself uh, admiring uh, other personal zines 
and did that one myself. And it wasn't just it wasn't just the the art that that uh, that was in it. It was the writing and the uh, uh, the personal experiences that were shared that was uh, part of the fun. The the autobiographical nature of fan writing is fa always fascinated me. It's one of the things that made me become a fan writer as well. And it really is autobiography, uh, personal autobiography uh, as an essay, uh, uh, because most of the time people are writing about their experiences or their life or, or whatever. And I, I mean, a classic example would be, you know, a lot of uh, um, Gary Hubbard wrote a column that appeared in lots of fanzine called The, um, the, the Cracked Eye. And he all he ever wrote about was his adventures and his life and the people that he knew and stuff, yeah. but it's, it's brilliant stuff. And, um, every bit is as fascinating to read as something you might find in New Yorker. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, I started publishing fanzines because of course I actually, I started probably because I wanted to get artwork from other people. When I published the uh, first issue uh, of a fanzine uh, called Lizard Inn, uh, I did three issues of that. Uh, I just sent out letters to all sorts of people. To Rotzler, Rotzler sent me an off fat envelope full of artwork uh, that astonished me of portfolios and, and stuff like that. Grant was one of the people that re uh, replied. Jack Gaughan replied and various other people. And I was just amazed that by just simply sending a letter, I could get this brilliant stuff and then present it on to some uh, somebody else. And then um, after I, um, I got to uh, Northern Virginia, I got more involved in the kind of classic mimeographed Fanish fanzine. I published one called uh, Boonfark, which was uh, lasted for nine issues, and it was very fanish essays and artwork and and the like. And uh, then uh, some years later, Ted White and I uh, published a a weekly uh, fanzine uh, that was called uh, Pong. We did forty two issues of that, and I did little postage sized drawings for every issue. Um. And um, uh, that's what got me my one uh, Hugo nomination in 1983 was 42 issues of uh, a dozen or more little tiny <laughs> drawings. Uh, and then after that, um, I, um, I uh, co-published a, a fanzine, a semi-pro zine called Science Fiction I with a guy named Steve Brown. And we were very much part of the cyberpunk uh, movement. And we published a lot of uh, Bill Gibson and uh, uh, those authors and, and they were car columnists and stuff like that. And then finally in the nineties, Ted White and I did a classic, huge oversized bloated fanzine called Blatt um, that lasted unfortunately only for four uh, issues, but it published some truly amazing things like a story from written by a fan uh, uh, who happened to be behind the uh, the Iron Curtain, uh, not the Iron Curtain, the wall in Berlin when it came down. So we ended up with an article about what it was like to be on the other side of the wall when it came down and lots of other things. And I've gotten great as much satisfaction from being a fan editor as I have from being uh, a fan artist because it allows me to plug into all these talented people, kind of bring them all together. And uh, that's a lot of joy there. Dan, when you were publishing your fanzine, did you publish really thick issues so thick that you had to invest in a industrial stapler? Oh, yes. I still have two of them in the next room. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that that to me was like the equivalent of a moonshot where I realized I had a problem that because I'd publish uh, Creative City for K.A., and I think it was about 24 pages that you could manage to get a traditional office stapler to staple through. But anything above that was ridiculous. You couldn't do it. Yes, Ted, Ted and I got up well close to 100 pages in the in the last yeah. couple of issues of Blatt. And I, we had to get one of these industrial staplers. Fortunately, we didn't have to pay anything for reproduction because my wife worked in an office that had state-of-the-art uh, a Xerox machine and and she had a key and we'd go in there in the middle of the night and run off 
hundreds and hundreds of pages of the fanzine. As soon as she lost that job, that was the end of the fanzine. Oh, so, yeah. Well, there's always was, uh, reasons for anything. I mean, or, you know, it, this is probably a sidebar. I remember um, teletype machines, my very first job. Well, I was still in um, high school working as a production assistant, creating artwork for a company, a motorcycle company. Uh, in the back, they fulfilled their orders with a teletype machine. And so I would go in there in the evening and start typing on this enormous machine, which is the size of a refrigerator. And the amazing thing is I could say, well, what's the weather in Rome? And I'd get note, I'd get information back. This is the weather in Rome right now. Or ask for news article, what's, what events are happening in Rome? And they'd get these enormous articles about Rome. What's the traffic in Rome? And I, of course, I didn't need to know any of this, but the idea that I could sit there and, and type on something that this mechanical keyboard connected to this enormous refrigerator size machine, and I'd get answers back, changed my life. Now I have a phone. <laughs> Besides, the refrigerator's in my hand. <laughs>